Good morning. Welcome to Grace Calvary Chapel. Let's all stand as we worship the Lord this morning.
mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place, a grace, from deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like a flower, comes flowing. Sin wash white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place for sin and shame.
Sing that again. You sound beautiful this morning. Oh, to be God, forever that hope is in our heart, Lord. And we just thank you so much that, uh, Father God, we can just learn to live each day to be more and more like you, Father. Uh, Father, just uh, uh, just bless our hearts, Father. Just keep our eyes focused on you, Lord. And as we continue to study about uh, the cross this morning, Father, just let us be reminded of that great sacrifice for our sins, Lord. We just thank you and love you for all you've done. Open up our hearts and minds to this morning's message. In Christ we pray. Amen. I want to take one hand before you have a seat. All righty. Woo, you guys made it. All right. So welcome to Grace Calvary Chapel. And hey, if you're new or you're visiting, please take your time to fill this out. It's just our way of getting to know you. On the back side, there's a place for a prayer. So if you, have, you need prayer, you know someone that needs prayer, please, by all means, fill this out. Put it into the agape box. There's one up here. Well, actually, there's two up here today and one up there. And uh, those are also there for your tithes and offerings. If so you have a money or check, you can put it in there. You can give online, right? And you can also text any of your offerings to the church, all right? Okay, on to the message here. here. Announcements, I'm sorry. Um, School of Ministry. It's going to start on the 20th, right? No, I'm sorry. Enrollment is open until the 20th because the class starts on the 21st. So if you're interested, let's get go. Let's get going, all right? Uh, children's ministry is in need of teachers of the following classes. For the 830 service, we have openings for the, uh, we need a teacher for the first and fifth grades, and also for the second, uh, for the two-year-olds and three-year-olds, and also for the four-year-olds and the kinder. So that's three different teachers. But you know what? You can volunteer for all of them if you want, all righty? Um, also for the 11 o'clock service, we have an opening for two- and three-year-olds, uh, four through kinder, and you can contact Evie Goodman. She's not in here right now, but she's out there, okay? Ministry fair, wow, this ties in perfectly. It's going to be Sunday, February the 17th. That's next weekend, all right, next Sunday, after the first and second services. Uh, if you're interested in, in serving the Lord, because you're not serving us, you're serving God, remember that. Uh, Please come and look into what we have here. There are different ministries, and we all need help, right? All righty. So get your game on. So if you're interested in getting hurt, I'm sorry, playing football, uh, by all means, come every, at the end of every month. We're going to get together uh, over at O.P. Schnagel at 3 o'clock and just have fun. And, we, you know, we need cheerleaders too. No, not tackle. Hey, come on, brother. Hey, uh, we need hecklers too. So if you're going to come down and encourage your brothers, you know what? We have sisters that have won MVP in this game. I kid you not. So come on down and play with us, all right? All right, guys. That's it. Pastor Joe, you ready? All right. Well, good morning. Good to see you all. We 
a number of us went to the uh, Happily Ever After Marriage Conference and had a good time. A little dreary day yesterday because of all the rain. Uh, I think we had 11 couples up there. Sheila and I got to teach and, you know, I'm thinking I, I may teach that sermon here. See, ruffle some feathers, so to speak. I won't tell you when, that way, you know, you, you, you still show up. Because if I tell you beforehand, you, a lot of you may not come. But uh, and I won't tell you what it's about either, because then, you know, uh, just, to, just to help you. Amen? So consider it next year when... when uh, Calvary South Austin holds that, holds that conference. I think it would be good for you. Good for all of us. Today we continue our study through the Gospel of John. John 19, 23 to 27. Please stand with me and we'll read these verses together. John 19, 23 to 27. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Lord, we thank you for this time, for the opportunity to study and uh, we pray you would teach us and give us application of your word. And we're so grateful that you went to the cross, died for our sins, and have given us eternal hope and eternal life in you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So John nineteen twenty three to 27, that you may believe for hope in the darkness. Uh, two parts, hope after the crucifixion, John 19, 23, 24. Secondly, hope for a broken heart, John 19, 25 through 27. It's been said that a person can live 40 days without food, four days without water, four minutes without air, but less than four seconds without hope. Hope keeps us alive even when life is at it's darkness. And as we look at the crucifixion of Christ, uh, things seemed hopeless. Jesus was dead. Soldiers were gambling for his tunic. And his mom was distraught. But yet at times, hope comes when life is at its darkness. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, For his anger is but for a moment. And his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes with the morning. So let's first look at hope after the crucifixion. Uh, these two verses, 23 and, and 24, I'm going to read them to you once again. And it reads, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. It's been said that no other religion has at its heart the humiliation of its God. And yet that's what we see here, the total humiliation of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross for the sins of the world, uh, eventually naked before 
mankind. Uh, the interesting thing here, we, we see there, there were soldiers there gambling for that last piece of clothing. How many soldiers would be there at the crucifixion? Well, actually, from last week's study, we know there would be four. Uh, there's a quantarian of, of soldiers who had gone up with Jesus. And we also know that the average Jewish male wore five pieces of clothing. He wore an outer robe. He wore a belt. He wore sandals. He wore a turban or a head cover. And then he also wore a tunic. You have four soldiers. You have five pieces of clothing. Somebody grabbed the sandals. Somebody took home the belt. Somebody had the turban. Somebody had the outer cloak. The only thing remaining was what? The tunic, right? That was the last piece of clothing that was remaining. Now, they could have divided it up in a couple of ways. They could have tore it apart and everybody got a little piece. Well, that would have kind of messed things up, right? You tear something in half, it's of no good. It's like that child who was taken uh, to Solomon, you know, whose baby is it, right? Cut it in half, you each get a piece. Well, that's no good. No, somebody needs to take it home, complete. And so they divide to gamble for it. And verse 23 tells us this. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, so Jesus is hanging on the cross. They took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier. Four soldiers, everyone gets one. But the tunic is left. Uh, and the interesting thing about the tunic is that... The tunic was seamless. The tunic was seamless. Um, and it reminds us of what? And you know, I've heard some crazy things about this tunic being seamless. And maybe you have as well. Uh, there's a part of Christianity will say, well, it just tells you that Jesus was what? Rich. You ever heard that before? That he was rich because nobody, very... Few people had a seamless tunic. I mean, it would require a, a great amount of money to procure one. That's not the reason he had a seamless tunic. Jesus was our high priest. And Exodus 28, 31 to 32 says that the high priest wore a seamless tunic. And so Jesus then wearing this seamless tunic as our high priest. And there he is, hanging on the cross, totally naked. Uh, now, the Jews wouldn't really allow that, so it's unknown uh, what occurred here. But it reminds us that Christ came all the way down. 2 Corinthians 2, 8 and 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And there, Corinthians is speaking of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. So they said to one another, verse 24, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them and They cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. And this comes from Psalm 22, verse 18. And in a moment, I'm going to read that psalm to you. There's 31 verses in the psalm. And, and it uh, kind of gives us a precursor to the crucifixion of Jesus. But when David wrote this psalm, there's no such thing as crucifixion. No such thing. And so... We see how the Holy Spirit then, looking into the mind and heart of David, allows him to write about this before it's even occurred. No such thing as crucifixion. And yet David just gave us details of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 22, it reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 1. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of 
my groaning. And certainly Jesus would echo those words in the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. And you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. I knew I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me for trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong booze of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up uh, like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count on my bones. They stare and gloat over me. And there you see it. Even David describing how Jesus was pierced and yet how he, his bones weren't broken. They divide my garments. And there's that verse, Psalm 22, 18, among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the nations or families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all, all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. And shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. He shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. As you look at Psalm 22, I see the vivid details of the cross, the exhaustion of Christ, his physical torment, the unusual, the unusual position of his body, his raging thirst, his hands and feet being pierced, uh, only known in the mind of God but revealed to David. Now, Jesus knew he would die. Matthew 17, 22, it reads, Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And so in all this, being beyond recognition, hanging naked on the cross, totally humiliated, and yet there was hope. Yet there was hope. It was Friday, right? But Sunday was coming. And in the darkest of times, hope would shine through. Truth is, maybe in your life, maybe it's a Friday. And things are dark. Things are dim. And you're wondering, is there hope? Is there hope? And as we look to the cross, we see that there is hope. There's a, 
a southern gospel song by the Booth Brothers. And believe me, I don't know who these folks are. I'm not going to sing the song. I'm not into southern gospel. Okay, I, if we go to uh, my mother-in-law's church, we'd be right at home with this stuff. But it's called Beyond the Cross. And I'm going to read it to you. And it says, Needing strength for my journey, I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, Is this the place where hope abides? And this he said to me, Beyond the cross is a tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore. Then I sought reassurance and I went to the tomb, to the place where his body once laid. And I cried, Lord, help me see. Is there hope for me? And I heard him say, beyond the cross is a tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore. Beyond the cross is a tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore, evermore. Now there is hope. Uh, we can trust in Jesus. Um, we need to understand that he loves us, that he chose us, and that there is hope for all of us. So even when, when life seems at its darkest, right, Jesus hanging on the cross, crucified, humiliated, the disciples scattered, everybody gone, you may be at that time in your life even today, but there's hope because Sunday is coming. Jesus will be resurrected and we will have eternal life. So there's hope after the crucifixion. There's also hope for a broken heart. Let me read you verses 25 to 27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is only recorded here in the Gospel of John. The other Gospels don't have this little story that took place. Uh, only John records it. And maybe because... John is the one whom Jesus was speaking to. Um, there's a teacher teaching her Sunday school class on magnetism. Uh, and she demonstrated a magnet. Do you know how a magnet works and how you can bring the two sides together? and Boom, it clumps together. Then you turn it around and it repels each other. And, and she said, I'm going to give you guys a, a, a test on magnet. And the next week she wrote out a test and, and she, one of the questions was, my, uh, my name has six letters. The first letter is M. What am I? Well, if you were in class, you would write what? Magnet. Half the class wrote magnet. What did the other class write? Mother. The other half of the class rode mother. You know, there's no love in the world like the love of a mother. Your son could be an axe murderer. And the only thing a mother would say is, oh, he was such a good boy. You know, a mom will love the worst of sons. Uh, and as we look at this story, uh, it's, it's difficult if you're a mom to look and, and to imagine the, the pain going through the heart of Mary as she sees her son hanging on the cross, totally humiliated and dying right before her. Uh, such pain that uh, difficult to understand and, and to comprehend and yet, as Jesus was there hanging on the cross, he teaches us a few lessons, doesn't he? Even in the midst of his great suffering, he's always thinking 
of somebody else. What happens when we suffer? You know, when we're hurting, whether we're hurting physically or we're hurting spiritually or emotionally, uh, we're usually not thinking about others. We're thinking about who? About us. We're throwing pity parties and, and we're becoming angry when somebody says something to us. And, and you know, there we are. Just uh, As my buddy going through a divorce one time, he had his bottle of, of Jack Daniels in his hand and his family went to try to take it away. And, and, and they went to grab it and he looks at them and he said, you don't know what suffering is. Give me back my bottle. No, I think Jesus knew what suffering was. And he gives us a great example that even in the midst of our suffering, we can care for others. So let's look at verse 25. It reads, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And we also know John was there, right? The one whom he loved. His cousin, actually. Cousin of Jesus. Jesus' mom was there. His aunt was there because it was his mother's sister. So you had family there. But you had what? Four women and how many men? One. Four women and one man. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. And as I said, it's difficult to understand the agony of Mary as she saw her son crucified. Agony. We don't use that word much, do we? The English do. When I say English, those from England, they, they use, you know, they'll, they'll something, well, you know, they'll get hurt in some way and, and they'll use agony, they'll say. They won't say, I'm hurting. They'll say, agony. Just trying to just, you know, the immensity of their pain that they're going through. They'll use that term. And yet we see Jesus here suffering greatly. So you have his mother, Mary. You have his mother's sister. You have Mary, the wife of Clopas. And you have Mary Magdalene. And we may ask, well, where's all the other guys? You know, where's James? Where's Andrew? Where's Peter? Well, they're all scattered and, and gone. Uh, it's not surprising that as we read the Bible, we see faithful women throughout Scripture. Some people unmistakably say that, that the Bible is a male-dominated book. And nothing could be further from the truth. You look at the Old Testament, you have Miriam, the sister of Moses. You have Deborah, political leader during the time of Judges. You have Abigail, one of the wives of David. You have Esther, who became queen of Persia. You have Huldah. Try not to name your children Huldah. But you have Huldah, prophetess in the Old Testament. Who was the first convert in Europe? Lydia, a woman. And so we see all these women here. Even from my perspective as, as a pastor, when it comes to people volunteering, who does most of the work? Women do. You know, how are, one author said, how are our churches beautified, our sick tended, our poor fed, our children taught and cared for? It's the women who do much of the work. No women are the church's strong rock. They were last at the foot of the cross. And they are first at the altar. And so you have his mother's sister. Who was this? Uh, this was Salome from Mark 16. Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John. Now she was bold because she went to Jesus, right? Her nephew. And asked him, you know, who can... Will you let my... Uh, I guess in that time, maybe she would have said, well, you let your cousin sit on your right hand and on your left. Jesus said, well, that's not for me to decide, you know. But there she is, her mother's sister. Next in line, you have Mary, the wife of Clopas. A lot of Marys here. 
the Virgin Mary, mother's sister. Then you have Mary, the wife of Clopas. So certainly a common name. Which, which Clopas was this? Um, it could be that uh, in Luke 24, there's a disciple of Christ named Cleopas. And maybe we're speaking of, of that. Uh, we're not sure exactly, but James the Less, one of the 12 apostles, he's called James the Less, the son of Alphaeus. And Alphaeus is actually a Hebrew variant of the term Clopas. So it could be the mother of James the Less. And then you have Mary Magdalene. Maybe certainly one of the most famous Marys, right? The one who had demons expelled, seven demons expelled from her. She was a suspect woman, but yet she gave her heart to the Lord. And you have these women here, broken hearted, but brave hearted at the same time. And you also, in verse 26, you have John. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And there's John. That's how John described himself. The disciple whom he loved. And I've often told you, I know I've said it more than once, that's the way you should describe yourself as well. If you know that God loves you, you can describe yourself as the disciple whom he loved. Now, if you question the love of God, then maybe you can't say that. If you question his love for you, maybe that's difficult for you to comprehend and difficult for you to even say, but you should be able to say that, having that type of relationship with God, that I'm the disciple whom he loved, that he loves me. And it's evident. It's evident on the cross. Uh, cross over here. Evident on the cross and evident in his caretaking of my life. I'm the disciple whom he loved. And Jesus saw his mother, and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby. He said to his mother, Woman, or woman, behold your son. Now, in those times, woman, behold your son, was uh, not a bad way of speaking to a lady. In fact, it was common. It was, it was a, like calling her madam. Uh, that's the manner in which women would be uh, addressed. And yet we see Mary and the difficulty, the pain, the suffering going through her heart. Certainly of all the people watching the cross that day, uh, the hardest would have been on Mary. Uh, and yet, you know, this was foretold. It was foretold in the Gospel of Luke. You remember the story of Simeon? In Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 30. It reads, Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed... They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, being Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there is a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so what had been revealed to Simeon was that God had told him, the Holy Spirit told him, you're going to see the Messiah. Before you die, you'll get to see the Messiah. And so Simeon would go to the temple to see the, you know, the newborns being purified there. And he would, he would wait, you know, and he would wait for the Holy Spirit to tell him which one it was going to be. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace 
according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, I don't know if Mary or Joseph knew him. They probably didn't. But imagine you're, you're dedicating your child, your newborn. Here comes this old man. Can I hold him? You know? Can I hold him? And, and, and he takes Jesus in his arm and, and he's saying, I have seen the salvation of the Lord. And you can imagine what's going through Mary's heart. The angel had already spoken to her, spoken to Joseph as well. You know, this is Jesus. You shall name him Jesus. The Lord shall save. And here he is. And Simeon went on to say something else in Luke chapter 2. In verses 33 to 35, it reads, And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many of Israel. And for a sign that it is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. In other words, he will break your heart. And there it was. Told before it even took place. And now fulfilled as Mary is standing before the cross. And as Jesus is being crucified in the pain going through her heart maybe she remembered a sword will pierce your heart and the great pain that would go through her life and so what did Jesus there again say to his mother woman behold your son so you're hanging on the cross. You've been beaten. You've been abused. You're about to die. And as I said before, what are you thinking about? Jesus thought of others. Always thinking of others. Right? In verse 27, then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So, woman, behold your son. And to the disciple, behold your mother. What words would Jesus speak from the cross? Well, he would say, Father, forgive them. He would also say, today... You will be with me in paradise. As he sees Mary and John, he would say, Behold your mother, and to John, or to Mary, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother. Take care of my mom, in a sense, right? Telling John that. So we see the heart of Christ, that he is able to think of others in the midst of, of his pain. And I know that's a very difficult thing to do. I mean it's difficult enough to think of others. When everything is going well. Because we're always thinking about ourselves. Right? And Christianity is others centered. It's others centered. And, and sanctification. The Lord working in us. For the rest of our life. He's trying to. Change that around. Trying to get the selfishness out of our life so that we begin to think of others. And we see how great it can go to, to where even when we're suffering and hurting, in pain physically, abandoned, we can think of others even then. If we reach into the power of God. That's the great example of our Savior. Now, so often we don't do that. We, we suffer or we suffer in self-pity or we groan or we moan and we complain. And we, you know, it's like we even blame God, right? We will. 
mature to the place to where we can begin to think at others at all times. Now as we look at what Jesus was doing, uh, he was certainly fulfilling Exodus 20:12, which says, honor your father and your mother. But people would question, why did Jesus hand Mary off to John? Didn't Jesus have other siblings? Of course he did. They had other. James, who, who would later on become the, uh, the patriarch of the church there in Jerusalem. Certainly. But he didn't hand her off to his brothers for a certain number of reasons. Number one, at that time they weren't believers. They weren't believers at all. And he wanted somebody who was a believer to take care of his mom. Right? Number two, maybe, uh, Jesus knew how long John's going to live. He's going to live to be a long, to be one of the oldest ones there, right? In fact, later on, we're going to speak to you about Revelation. You'll be on the island of Patmos. You'll be able to take care of mom. You're going to live the longest, dude. No, he didn't tell John that, but Jesus knew that, certainly. And maybe the third reason, John was there. Maybe the most obvious reason, John, there, no one else. I mean, there wasn't, you know, it was kind of slim pickings, right? Uh, who's going to, oh, John, you're there. You take care of mom, you know? And so Jesus certainly loved his mom. He loved her verbally, physically, patiently, and honorably. This would be a good study to do on Mother's Day. It remind me that. Maybe I'll, I'll do this study on, on Mother's Day. But what I want to share about is that there's hope for a broken heart. Uh, and there are many who have had broken hearts. There are parents who have lost children. And, and that's something that, uh, you know, in, in our, uh, in the world that we live in, in a perfect world, that would never happen. Right? A parent would never outlive their child. And yet there are many parents who have lost their children. And they suffer through great pain because of that. Um, we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a world that's been racked by sin. And we suffer the effects of it every single day. And all I can tell you is that there's hope for a broken heart. There'll be hope for Mary. There's hope for you. If you've suffered through that, there's hope. You need to hold on to Jesus Christ. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Psalm 34.18, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves the crushed in spirit. And you see Mary who lost, loses her son. The only perfect child that has ever lived in the history of the world. The only perfect child. Jesus Christ. And yet, parents certainly love their children. So there's great hope. There, there's hope also for... Uh, if you have a mom that needs being taken care of, there's hope. Place her in the hands of the Lord. Who greater to take care of than Jesus Christ himself? So there's hope. We, we live in a world that, that is difficult. Pain, suffering, hurt, heartache, broken hearts, and all that stuff. This little... These few verses teach us some very important truths as we apply it to our lives. 
There's hope. First of all, there's hope. It may be Friday for some of you. But there's hope. Sunday's coming. If your life is at its darkest point, look to the cross. Look to what happened there. And then consider the resurrection. And Jesus Christ, our living hope. Practically, uh, we look at the life of Christ and we marvel at how can a man going through such intense suffering still think about others and still be other-centered. And that's where Christ wants to take us. He wants to take us to that place of maturity where we get over the self-pity and the self-misery and all that stuff. And where we trust him to minister not only to us, but through us. Even in the midst of those difficult times. Such a great lesson that we learn there. Only possible through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. We certainly can't do that on our own. You know? So we cling to Jesus Christ. Amen. There's hope. Don't give up. I think one of the things that was said yesterday at the marriage conference, it's always too soon to quit. Don't throw in the towel on the Lord. It's always too soon to quit. There's always hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love and for the hope you give us, Lord. You, you allow us to wake up every morning with a living hope. Your mercies are new every morning, Lord. And while weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. Help us to remember that great hope that you gave us on the cross and in your resurrection and even in the midst of a broken heart, you heal the broken hearted, Lord, and you administer hope. And do that today, Father God. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.